Hey there folks, welcome to module 2 of the CompTIA A plus course. Just a reminder in case you're new here, this is module 2 of the 1100 series of A plus. In other words, the latest version of A plus. Now, if you're wondering what the main sections in this specific module is, there is four of them. The first one would be install and configure power supplies and cooling. So obviously in that section, we're going to be talking about all kinds of cool things about power supplies and various kinds of cooling like fans and liquid cooling. Then we'll be moving on to the second main section, which is select and install storage devices. So that's going to be about, you know, hard drives, that kinds of nonsense. Section three will be install and configure system memory. So for the most part, it's going to be in and around RAM, but obviously not limited to RAM. And then we'll move into the last and the fourth section, which is install and configure CPUs. Now, before we go ahead and jump into that first main section, do your homie a favor like usual. If you haven't done it already, give the video a like, boink that like button. It really does get this video in front of more people. And if you would like to know when module three of this course comes out or when I upload other nonsense, remember to subscribe. Otherwise, you might miss it. Okay, dokey. Now that I've got my selfless promotion out of the way like usual, Let's move into that first main section, which was install and configure power supplies and cooling. All right, folks, the first topic in this section should come as no surprise to you. That would be power supply units. You'll find a lot of people tend to refer to this as the PSU in a computer. So whenever you hear someone say PSU next time, well, now you know that's the power supply unit. There's a bit of a picture there on the right hand side for you guys of what that would actually more or less look like. So if you look at the back of the, of the average system unit, you will find this is normally towards the top at the back. That's not set in stone though, folks. You might find some cases this might actually be at the bottom, you know, depending on what kind of fancy case you've got. Some of the gaming cases, this normally tends to be towards the bottom. If it's a normal, you know, entry level office kind of PC, it's probably going to be the top. The fact of the matter is, it doesn't really matter where in the case it is, as long as it's somewhere in the case, as long as the cables is able to reach the components like the motherboard, ACES, doesn't matter where it is. So that picture that I've got there for you guys, even though it's a bit of a cartoon picture, is as standard as it gets. It's got one port for your, your power cable, which we refer to as a kettle cord, and it's got a standard on and off switch at the back. Now that's not set in stone folks, you'll find some power supplies out there actually has two ports at the back, two kettle ports. One of them is to input electricity or power, that's the one we see in front of us right now. The other one's going to look somewhat different and that is to allow you to plug a kettle cord into the power supply, which is supposedly supposed to go to another component like a monitor slash screen. Not a lot of folks do that because you're putting unnecessary strain, you know, on your power supply. So it's not advisable to go and do that if you have one of those ports. Instead, I would recommend you rather go and plug that screen or monitor directly into the power, not into your power supply. Now, as for buttons, now obviously we've got a button there already. That is to turn the power off to the power supply. And if you turn that switch off, you'll find everything inside the case itself is going to be dead. At least that's the theory. I would not take my chances with that. I mean, I've never had a case where it would not be dead inside, but you never know. Safety comes first, guys. So whenever you find yourself needing to work inside a computer case, don't just flip the switch at the back of the power supply. I want you guys to plug that power cable out as well. Safety is always number one when it comes to the exam. And quite frankly, just when it comes to your life and just, you know, normal work environment. So plug the cable out from the wall socket, plug it out from the power supply and turn off the freaking power switch at the back. Then you really know it's off. Um, something I also want to mention you guys, obviously you should never open a power supply unit. Never, ever, ever. They are so freaking cheap, these things. It's just not worth it. That's the main reason, I suppose. It's not the only reason. So whenever you find yourself with a power supply that's broken, whether it be your own, a customer, a client, a user, it's just always better just to go replace it because of how freaking cheap these things are. But that's not the only reason. It's also very dangerous to go and open these things. 
So even though they might be plugged out, it's got capacitors, it's got resistors. The capacitors are often referred to as caps for short, and that means they store electricity. Sometimes very large quantities of electricity, folks. So much so that it can actually put you in ICU or actually kill you in some cases. So you absolutely do not want to find yourself opening one of these unless you're an electrician. You know, and even if you are an electrician, it's probably still not going to be worth your while. Like I said, it's so freaking cheap. The labor cost is probably going to cost 10 times more than what a new power supply is going to cost you. So why would I go and fix it if you can fix it just to have it second hand when I can buy myself a brand spanking new one? for 10 times less. It just doesn't make any sense. Now, as for input voltages, folks, these things come with two input voltages. You'll find some of these power supplies actually has like an extra small little switch at the back. You normally need like a screwdriver to be able to flip that switch. And that allows you to change the input voltage. The input voltage can either be 100 to 127 volts, or it can be 220 to 240 volts. This depends on which country you're in in the world. So it's got nothing to do with the southern hemisphere or the enormous hemisphere, you know, like some folks might think. Absolutely not. Some countries randomly out there run at about 100 to 110 volts on average, where you get other countries that run about 220 to 240 volts. So depending on what the voltage rating is for your particular country, you just need to make sure the back of that power supply that it says the right voltage, because if it doesn't, yeah, you can kind of guess what's going to happen. It is not going to end well. It's going to blow your power supply and it's going to harm a lot of components inside your computer. So you don't want to do that. So if you find yourself, let's say, on 100 to 110 volts in your respective country and you need to move your machine to a country where the volts is higher, well, then you just switch the switch at the back. And vice versa. If you're on a high voltage and you're moving your machine to a country with a lower voltage, then, well, you just change the switch at the back, folks. Now, something I want to mention extra to you guys, um, power supplies does form part of a PBQ in the exam. Now, in case I have not mentioned PBQ in module one, PBQ is short for performance based question. In other words, simulation. In each of these A plus exams, you can get up to about six possible PBQs. Some folks get none. Some get all six of them in each of these A plus exams. The average person normally gets about three. Now, one of the PBQs in the exam is going to require you to go and build free computers. Now, it sounds very fancy and very complicated, but the fact of the matter is it's actually very straightforward. They're going to give you a list of hardware components, free power supplies, three different kinds of motherboards, three different kinds of system unit cases, a graphics card, a sound card, you know, that kinds of stuff. And you're going to be tasked with dragging the right components to the right kind of machine. So when it comes to power supplies, these three power supplies will be different voltages, different watts, that kinds of stuff. So that's the only kind of question you're going to get regarding power supplies in the exam. You know, you're going to be required to drag the right power supply to the right machine. I just felt I need to mention that to you guys. Uh, before we move on to the next topic, just a bit of a picture. You know, I want to throw you guys a couple of extra pictures here just so you can get a better idea of what power supplies actually look like. So there is a standard, standard, as standard as they come power supply for you guys. And let me throw another one here on the screen for you guys. There's another standard one, except this one, as you can see, it's got two kettle ports. The bottom one, that's the input that allows you to put voltage into the machine. The other one there, that is the female port, and that allows you to plug a kettle cord that goes to something like a screen of sorts. Now, if you do have one of those, which is very unlikely, I don't recommend you use that. You're actually putting unnecessary strain on your power supply. So if possible, try not to use that one, guys. You don't want to use that one. And then lastly, one extra picture for power supply before we move on to the next topic. The reason I'm showing you this one is not because it looks fancy or anything. It's because it's got a little button there at the bottom, not the green one. That is the on-off switch. On the left of that port where you would plug in your kettle cord, you'll notice it's like a little red switch, very freaking small. That switch, my friends, is the voltage switch. So to be able to switch that little bugger, you need something like a very small flat screwdriver to be able to switch the voltage switch. Do not go and tamper that with that switch unless you know what you're doing. Anywho, let's move on to our next topic in this section. 
that will be power supply connectors. In other words, the various cables you get that is connected to the power supply that are supposed to connect to the assorted devices and components inside of your case. So the first cable and the main cable, quite frankly, is the one called your P1 connector. The name itself doesn't really make any sense, but the P1, guys, is the main one. So if you go look at all the cable strands coming from your power supply, there's going to be one with one big fat connector. The biggest, the fattest one is this one in front of us. That is called your P1 connector. If you go and count the pins, you'll find there's 24 pins. Two rows, each of them containing 12 pins. So it's quite a lot, is it? Now, if you go check even closer, you'll notice that four of those pins can actually detach. You'll see there on the bottom left, it's got two clips. So an extra clip allows you to go and clip those extra four pins loose. Now you might wonder, but why does it do that? That is because there are actually folks still out there that's got very old computers. And the old computers, believe it or not, those motherboards only took 20 pins, not 24 pins. They needed less power to work. Now, if someone finds themselves a very old machine, and let's say, God forbid, their power supply gives in, you know, eventually, it's going to happen at some point in time, will they still be able to find those old power supplies? Nope, then definitely not. So they're going to have to go and buy themselves a brand spanking new one. Unfortunately, the new ones comes out of 24 pins, not 20. Now, you'll notice you can go and remove the four extra pins and just plug in the 20 remaining pins into that old motherboard if that customer or that user still has a very old computer. Now, if it's an average, normal, modern computer, which is 99% of the time going to be the case, then you just go and plug it in as is, guys. Now, there's many, many other connectors. So I think just to give you guys a bit of an idea, here is another picture. So the top left one, that is the P1 we literally just spoke of. You can see there on that P1, top left, it's got 20 pins plus four. The four extra ones is removable. If you look at the top one in the middle, the one that says PCIe, you'll find some power supplies, definitely not all of them, comes with those cables. Some power supplies has one of those, some power supplies has two of those or more. That is for your graphics card. Yes, for your graphics card. This kind of confuses people because the average person is under the assumption that the graphics card gets its power from the motherboard as soon as you plug it in. Now, that is not entirely wrong, but some graphics cards consume so much power and need so much oomph that you need to give it a bit of a boost. And to do that, we plug in these extra cables directly into the graphics card. Yep. The top right-hand side one is a SATA power connector. That is for your SATA hard drives or for your SATA optical drives. I mean, if you're lucky enough to even find an optical drive, I mean, nobody has those anymore. They're becoming extinct. Bottom left, speaking of extinct, that is a floppy disk drive power connector. <laughs> you are really not going to find those. I don't think any of the new power supplies comes out of that. So most likely the only time you'll find those or see those is if you happen to come across a very old power supply, or just quite frankly, a very old computer. The one at the bottom in the middle is a P4 connector that normally plugs in right next to your CPU somewhere on the motherboard. Where exactly, I cannot tell you, but I can tell you it's somewhere near the CPU. I can't tell you exactly where because it does ever so slightly vary from motherboard to motherboard. Most often you'll find it's going to be somewhere towards the left or somewhere towards the top of the CPU, but it can actually be any of the immediate area around your CPU. Then at the bottom right, we've got a four pin Molex connector. It's basically the same as the top right hand side, which is the SATA. The SATA is just the newer version of the Molex. The Molex one at the bottom right is what we used to use on our old optical drives, our old PATA drives, which some of you guys might know as IDE. It's also what we used to use on our old PATA hard drives. In other words, our old IDE hard drives. So you still will find a lot of power supplies, if not most power supplies of at least one of those connectors. But these days, we don't really use them that much. The only things we really use them for is to plug in the fans of your case, if your case comes with some sort of fancy fans, you know. All right, let's move on to our next topic, fan cooling systems. So we're in the cooling system section, specifically on the topic of fans. 
Now, I'm sure you guys are well aware that that's not the only way to cool down a machine, but it is the most common way to cool down the average machine. If you go and grab any box PC or laptop and you start opening it, what do you think you're going to find? Most likely a couple of fans, guys. So I think let's make our first topic here, heat sinks. What the cheese is the heat sink? So to help elaborate on that, there is a picture of a heat sink. I'm not talking about the black plastic fan, guys. I'm talking about the metal beneath that fan. It looks kind of shiny. It looks kind of white or silver in color. That is aluminium. It's a type of metal. It stays very cool, but it also absorbs heat very, very well. So you'll find on the average machine, you know, an average motherboard, there's quite a few of these heat sinks. The main one, you know, normally tends to stand out is the one you'll find, of course, on top of your CPU, your central processing unit. The idea here is the heat coming from the CPU is supposed to transfer into that heat sink. It's supposed to absorb it. And obviously it is still going to somewhat get warm. You know, yes, it absorbs heat very well. Yes, it stays cool very well, but it doesn't mean it doesn't get hot. It's still going to get hot. So when it gets hot, that's where the fan on top of it comes into play. That fan is going to keep blowing and it's going to blow air between those vents. You'll notice it's not a solid piece of metal. Instead, it's got vents. That is to allow airflow between the vents and to allow it to cool down a lot quicker and a lot easier, of course. So it works very much on the same principle as a car's radiator, guys. Now, something you should also be aware of, which is not mentioned technically right now in this point in the course, but I might as well mention it to you guys as an extra. When you put that heatsink on top of the CPU, on its own, it's not going to transfer heat to the heatsink very well, that CPU. You need to help it along. And to do that, we use something called thermal compound, also known as heat paste. So it's a little piece of liquid that looks kind of like toothpaste. You're going to rub a little bit there on your CPU, basically the size of your pinky nail, and then you're going to put the heatsink on. That basically allows the heat from your CPU to transfer so much better into the heatsink, guys. So what does it look like when the heatsink goes on top of the CPU? Well, guys, here's a picture for you guys. It's not the best picture, but it is a picture nonetheless. So way at the bottom of that picture, you can see your CPU socket. That is the place on the motherboard where the CPU chip is going to go into. You're going to get your CPU. You're going to slide it into that hole. At this point, we're just going to say slide it into that hole, but it's actually, you know, kind of technical when it comes to sliding into that hole. It's not a matter of, okay, let's just go and drop it into that hole. Definitely not, guys. You need to make sure you've got the right socket CPU. You need to make sure you align it correctly. There's a whole list of things you need to go and tick first before you just go ahead and drop that CPU in. Now, assuming you've done all of that and assuming you've already dropped the CPU into that socket, now all you need to do is just put a little heat paste, in other words, thermal compound or whatever you want to go and call it. And when you drop that heat sink on top of that with its fan. Now, since we've mentioned it so many times, I might as well put it here on the list. Thermal paste. They will definitely ask you guys about that in the exam. I guarantee it. I just can't know. I don't know for sure how many questions you're going to get or where in the exam it's going to be. But somewhere in your A plus exams, you will get asked about this. So they're going to ask you something along the lines of what can user one put on top of their CPU or between the CPU and the heatsink to allow heat to dissipate properly or to transfer properly. So that is thermal paste, guys. And like I've been seeing a couple of times right now, that thermal paste is not just called thermal paste. It's actually got many names. You can call it thermal compound. You can call it heat paste. All of those are sufficient, but I think in the exam they just refer to it as thermal compound, if I'm not mistaken. Something thermal in the exam, I'm not sure which one. Because I can't remember exactly which name they use, I'm just throwing them all out there on the screen for you guys. Then at least you know it's all of them is relevant, all of them are correct. So whichever one you see in the exam, well, then you know what it is. Alright, so yeah, not quite the next topic yet, but still on the topic of fan and cooling system. So let's talk about device and chassis fans. So depending on whether we're talking about a laptop or a desktop or a server and um, all of that, you know, that, that's going to dictate, you know, what your fan setup looks like and what your cooling setup looks like. So let's assume it's a normal computer chassis with normal fans. Some of the factors you need to go and look into and make absolutely sure is correct is things like airflow. 
it's not a matter of, okay, boys, let's go throw in some fans into this case. And uh, no. You need to make sure you put in the correct amount of fans. You need to make sure that they're flowing towards the right direction. Some of them are going to be blowing air inwards into the chassis. Other ones are going to suck air out of the chassis and blow it outwards. So you want to make sure you get the airflow correct. You'll find, for the average case, the fans in the front sucks air in, sucks it over the hard drives, because most of the time you'll find the hard drives in the front of the case. It cools the hard drive somewhat down. It sucks it in towards the motherboard general area. And then the back of the case, you've got a couple of extra fans that sucks the hot air out the back of the case. Now you can go and, you know, do it the other way around if you really want to. You know, some cases suck air in at the top or blow them out at the top. Um, some cases, you know, blow them out on the sides. It's up to you. You know, every case is unique, just like a person. But that's generally what you need to go and look at. Look at the airflow. You'll also find some cases have got sensors. Now, how many you've got now, fancy they are, I suppose, depends on how much money you're willing to throw at it. But at the very least, every computer these days has at least one sensor. And that's the CPU temperature sensor. So I think most motherboards these days also has a sensor for the fan speed that you can actually check in the BIOS or the UFI. So what's going to happen is if your CPU gets too hot, you know what's going to happen? Your computer will automatically shut down almost instantly. It's kind of the same as a car's engine, and it actually works in the exact same manner. Most cars these days, they've got sensors built into the engine. And should your engine get too hot for whatever reason, let's say the coolant is leaking, maybe there's no water in the engine or no antifreeze, it's leaking, it's too low, and if it senses your engine is getting too hot, your engine will actually cut out on you. This is to prevent your engine from getting any damage, because if it's going to not cut out, the engine is going to heat seize and you're going to basically need a whole new engine. Very, very expensive. Oopsie is what that is. Now CPUs, which is basically the engine of your computer, works in the same manner, folks. If a sensor detects that your CPU is getting too hot, well, it's going to cut the power to your CPU and obviously it's going to cut the power to the whole entire computer. This is all in an attempt to prevent any possible damage from occurring to your CPU. We're not saying there's going to be no damage, but usually you're going to be get lucky and there's going to be no damage. Last topic I want to add here, or sub, sub, sub topic, is maintenance, guys. Especially important when it comes to laptops, because laptops have got very small fans and very small air vents. So you need to make sure with a laptop that those air intake vents and the exit vents are clear of debris. Normally they form these giant dust bunny thingies there in front of the air vents. So just make sure you get that out of the way. If it's a computer case, same story really. It's just less often that's going to happen. Clean up your case. Make sure that the vents for the fans is clean, guys. Otherwise, you're going to cause obstruction. And it's not going to dissipate the heat as good as it's supposed to in your case. Anywho, still on the topic of cooling, but now moving to liquid cooling systems. So I think the name kind of explains itself, wouldn't you guys say? So liquid cooling systems is normally used in desktop cases, not exactly something you'll see of laptops. Instead of using fans to cool down something like your CPU, we're going to resort to using some form of liquid. Most commonly, this is going to be normal water, but it could also be other forms of liquid, like liquid nitrogen. And you'll notice in a lot of countries, you actually need a license to work with liquid nitrogen. And very often, it's very difficult to obtain. You can only get it from places like universities. In some cases, it's illegal to work with that unless you've got a license. It's also very freaking dangerous to work with that stuff if you don't know what you're doing. So unless you guys know exactly what you're doing and you've got proper training and it's not illegal in your country, sure, go and use liquid nitrogen. But do not do that if it's illegal and also do not do that if you don't have proper training of that. In that case, I would say, you know what, just go and use normal liquid. It's not worth your life, you know. So yeah, it's just safer. So liquid cooling, there is a bit of a picture for you guys on the right hand side, you can see there. On the left top side of that picture is where the CPU block would be, the water block as people would call it. It's got various tubing systems. How exactly they look, where exactly they go, all that kinds of stuff is going to vary from machine to machine. You know, it's, they're not, no two of them is exactly the same. Most people I have encountered out there just normally not use what we call an all-in-one. It comes with the liquid, it comes with the fans, it comes with like a little radiator, it's all in one little setup. 
So I'm going to list a topic here, which is water loop, tubing, pump, and reservoir, because you are going to need a looping system. You're going to need tubing. You're going to need a pump. And you, of course, is going to need a reservoir. You'll find a lot of folks out there will actually put some sort of coloring in that water, you know, just to make it look extra cool, especially if you've got a gaming case and you've got a couple of fancy colorful lights going on, then it really makes it look cool when you've got some sort of color in that, in that water. It's not a must, but it looks freaking cool. I must tell you guys that much. Now, why do we mention loop though? It's because it works very much the same as a car's engine once again. You know, that's just a coincidence that I'm saying a car's engine again. So with a car's engine, you'll find it's got a cooling system. Normally it's water, but it's often mixed with antifreeze. You're actually supposed to have antifreeze in there. So the engine heats up the coolant. You know, obviously as the engine works and does what it's supposed to do, the coolant goes out of the engine. It goes towards the front of the car, towards the radiator, where air is blowing in from the front between fins, and that cools that water down. It cycles into the engine again, and it just repeats the whole cycle. It works pretty much the exact same concept in a computer if you think about it. You know, so it's going to go over the CPU, which is kind of like your engine. CPU is going to heat up that liquid. Liquid's going to go away from the CPU into the radiator. And if you look at that picture at the right hand side where you see those two white fans, that is your radiator, guys. The liquid's going to go through there. It's going to get cooled down by that radiator. And then it's going to go out of the radiator, just like a car's radiator. And it's going to repeat the cycle and it's going to go back to the CPU. Just keep repeating and repeating. Other topics I'm going to add here, which is kind of pointless at this point, since I've already mentioned it, is the water block and the radiators and the fans. Most computers you'll find the radiators and the fan is an all-in-one on the right-hand side. Some of them have one fan, some of them have two fans, some of them have three fans. I think most of the ones I've worked with has normally got two fans, like the picture we see in front of us. Now, before we move on to our next topic and actually our main section, our next section, here's another picture for you guys, uh, more or less what a uh, water cooling system would look like. So you can see there is tubing, you can see the water block there on top of the CPU, you can see the reservoir for the water, you know, that's where you would normally put in your coloring if you'd like to go and do that. Um, yeah, gives you a pretty good idea. I think, you know what, let's, let's give you guys another picture. So there's another picture for you guys. You can see there that this guy's got all kinds of fancy gaming lights. This guy's got some coloring in the liquid. So it just really gives it an extra je ne sais quoi, if you want to call it that. And there's another picture for you guys. Check this guy. This guy made it look really fancy with the red liquid. So it's actually just water in most cases. But people tend to go and put some special coloring in it just to make it look extra cool. And wouldn't you do that? I know I would go and do that. I just can't afford to do that at the moment. I've got kids. That's what I need to say. When you've got kids, you can't really afford stuff like that anymore. Anyway, let's move on to our second main section in this video before the video gets too long. Select and install storage devices. So for the most part, guys, we're referring to hard drives. It's not necessarily limited to hard drives, but that's the main thing we're, of course, talking about here. So the first topic in this main section is mass storage devices. No surprise, right? And then I've got a picture here on the right hand side of a system unit. So you can see it's a cartoon picture. The side panel has been removed. It's actually a picture that we used in module one, two, I believe. So if you look at this picture of this case from the side, bottom right is normally where you would go and put your average hard drive. It's not set in stone though, definitely not these days at least. So maybe about five, I want to say 10 years ago, that was pretty much the case. You would definitely put your hard drives there end of story. Nowadays, not really. I mean, these days you can put those little thingies anywhere. You can put them at the bottom right. You can put them where your optical discs, you know, optical drives used to be since nobody's using optical drives anymore. Um, you'll find that the hard drives are also a lot smaller with a lot of people using solid state drives. Those hard drives are freaking small people. Very, very small, which means they fit in just about anywhere. You'll find some of these fancy new gaming cases the hard drive can actually fit in behind the motherboard. I kid you not. You can actually put it flat, parallel, behind the motherboard, guys. So that would be the drive base. The drive base is where do we put these hard drives? So up until not too long ago, you could only fit in like one, two, or three hard drives. If it was a gaming case, you could maybe put in four or five. Nowadays, I don't know, I've seen some of these computer cases of like 10, 20 hard drive base. It is insane. 
Now, what is drive unit form factors? That is the size of the hard drive for the most part. So not too long ago, we only got like one size hard drive for desktops and one size hard drive for your laptops. Laptops is really small, those hard drives, they fit in the palm of your hand. With desktop hard drives, are those big, fat, heavy ones that you would normally slide in there at the bottom right of that picture. Nowadays, if you go check the hard drive size, it's not exactly set in stone, guys. So a desktop hard drive can in fact now be the physical dimensions and size of a laptop hard drive, especially if we're talking about solid state drives. Solid state hard drives is the exact same physical dimensions for desktop computers as well as laptops. They fit in just about anywhere. Let's add the topic of external and removable storage. So I think everybody knows what the heck that is. So the most simplest example will probably be a memory drive, flash drive, USB stick, they're all the same. It's got so many names, it's not even funny. Then of course you get your normal external hard drives. You can plug those into USB ports. You can sometimes plug them into other ports. They come in various shapes, they come in various sizes. But what they do have in common is it's not physically inside your laptop or desktop, it's externally. You normally plug them into the machine and there you go. Very quick, very easy to transport data from one machine to another in very large quantities, I might add. And then, folks, let's add the last topic I want to add to this slide, which is reliability performance comparisons. So reliability, in my personal opinion, the old mechanical hard drives last longer. That's not assuming, of course, you're not going to go and drop it, assuming you're not going to bring it near a magnet, that kinds of stuff. So you're assuming you treat your hard drives well, a mechanical hard drive, which is the old hard drives, which has got movable parts, they last a lot longer, guys. They don't give you the best performance, but they last a lot longer. And if you find yourself in a situation where you need to read and write to a hard drive a lot, especially, let me see if I can think of an example, maybe something like a CCTV system, you know, where you need cameras. Those hard drives, obviously, you're going to be writing to that hard drive constantly, every freaking day. So if you find yourself in a situation like that, it will be best to go and use your old mechanical hard drives. To those hard drives, you can read and write a lot more for a lot longer. If you look at solid state hard drives, they've got their own sets of benefits and their own sets of drawbacks. The most famous and the most obvious benefits of a solid state hard drive is the speed. They are insanely faster, so it's very nice to go and make those your main hard drive on your computer. But if you find yourself in a situation where you're going to be reading and writing to that hard drive a lot, especially if it's continuous, then solid state might not be the best situation for you guys. It might not be the best hard drive for you guys. It's got a limited amount of time that so you can go and read and write to it. Most people are not aware of that. It's not actually part of the A-plus course. I'm actually throwing that just in for you guys as an extra because I feel I should. So, yeah, if you're going to find yourself in a situation where you're going to read and write to the hard drive a lot, rather use the old mechanical. If it's just speed you're looking for because you want to do gaming or something, well, yeah, then solid state is the way to go. Solid states, you can go and drop them, you can bring them near magnets, that kind of stuff, no corruption is going to occur. If you look at the mechanical hard drive, which generally lasts longer, unfortunately, those hard drives are very sensitive, guys. If you bring them near a magnet, if you drop them, you know, because they've got movable parts, they get damaged. You normally want to try and avoid that. Now, speaking of solid state hard drives, I think let us add that as a topic here. That actually is a topic in the course, in case you're wondering. So that is more or less what one looks like, at least the cartoon view of one. You can see it's very slim, it's very small, it fits into the palm of your hand, gives you massive performance characteristics, massive. So the one at the top is a normal hard drive. <laughs> I'm saying normal because that kind of feels like it is normal these days. The one at the bottom is one that you'll actually plug in directly on the motherboard. And those, that's kind of, I wouldn't say it's new technology, but it is freaking cool technology. Not all motherboards support that. But if you find yourself with a motherboard that supports that, you can plug that directly into the motherboard. It's another form of solid state memory that just makes your computer so much quicker, guys. But if you just want storage that's just very, very quick, normal solid state hard drive would probably be the way to go. Now, since I've just mentioned what a solid state hard drive looks like, 
it only makes sense that I should probably put a topic here that says normal hard disk drives. In other words, the old mechanical hard drives. So since we're talking about mechanical, there is a picture for you guys. If you were to go and strip one and open one up, you'll find at first glance it looks like there's only six screws. But in reality, there's a seventh screw that's normally hidden underneath the sticker. It's not always dead center, so you're going to have to go and check it. You can either go and remove the label or the sticker of the hard drive, or you can just make a small incision through the sticker. If I'm being honest with you guys, it's normally a lot quicker and a lot easier just to make a small incision through that sticker and just to remove the screw like that. You'll find that these screws are not normal flat or star screws. Instead, they look very weird. You're going to need a special screwdriver set. You can normally find them at your local hardware store to be able to open that hard drive. Now, whatever you guys do, do not touch that disk if you were to open a hard drive because as soon as you touch that disk, you might as well kiss the data goodbye on that hard drive. All right, let's move on to our next topic, redundant array of independent disks. Now, isn't that a big fancy word? So this is actually more commonly known as RAID. Everybody just calls this RAID. Now, what is RAID? RAID is something we most commonly do with hard drives. These days, you'll for the most part just see it happening in servers. And here and there, maybe in something like a NAS drive, if you guys know what a NAS drive is. In the old days, 15, 20 years ago, RAID was something we also used to do in our own personal desktop machines, if you had enough money to throw at your machine back then. And if you did do that on your local machine, or if you decide to do this these days in the server environment, what does it provide us with? It provides you with, or is used for things like fault tolerance, and it's also used for things like speed. Now, which benefits exactly you get depends on which RAID you use. Yes, that is right. You get different kinds of RAID, many kinds of RAID. You get RAID 0, you get RAID 1, you get RAID 5. That's just some of the three most common ones you get. And there is many, many other ones as well. Now, for now, in this course, that's the only ones I'm going to mention, and that's the only ones you need to know for this course and for the exams. Yes, this is an exam topic, guys. All right, I'm going to list the three raids that you guys need to know for this course and for this exam. I'm going to list what the minimum amount of hard drives is that you require to get this to work, because that is something you need to know. There is, in fact, a minimum amount of hard drives required to get each and every one of these to work. I'm going to list what benefit each and every one of these gives you as well. Also something you guys need to know. So the very first one up here is RAID 0. The other one that I mentioned to you guys earlier was RAID 1. The third one, the last one I'm going to mention in this particular course is RAID 5. Now, looking at the first one on this list, RAID 0, what benefit does it provide us with? RAID 0 gives us speed. Some of you guys might know this as performance. So, whether we call it speed, what do you call it? Performance, potato, potato, that's what it gives you. Now, RAID 1 does not give us speed. Instead, RAID 1 gives us fault tolerance, if you know what fault tolerance is. Moving on to our third one on the list, RAID 5. Believe it or not, this actually gives you all the benefits of RAID 0 and RAID 1 and then some. So RAID 5 gives you speed or performance. It gives you fault tolerance and it gives you a parity bit or it makes use of one at least. Now let's move on to the minimum amount of hard drives required. Now if you have a normal machine with a normal hard drive, you are probably using that hard drive to its full extent. But if you would like to make use of RAID 0, RAID 1, or RAID 5, you will need to add extra hard drives to your personal computer or your server. It's probably going to be a server these days. But that does not necessarily mean you're actually getting more space. Definitely not, guys. The extra hard drives you're adding is to give you some of these benefits we're talking about. So when we talk about RAID 0, the minimum amount of hard drives that is required is 2 you will need to install two hard drives into that machine or that device. It does not give you more space, but it does give you speed. Your data will be split zigzag between the two drives. So it'll be A on the one side, B on the other side. C on the one side, 
D on the other side. So it's going to be a zigzag, zigzag situation there. So that gives you speed. It does not give you redundancy. It does not give you fault tolerance. So in that situation, if you were to lose any one of those two hard drives, you lose all your data because you cannot recover from that. Each of the two hard drives would basically have 50% of your data, if you think about it. And if I lose so much as one of those two hard drives, well, you can kiss all of it goodbye. That's what's going to happen. So you get the benefit of speed and performance, but you do not have fault tolerance or redundancy. Now, moving on to RAID 1. What is the minimum amount of hard drives you need for RAID 1? That, folks, will also be two hard drives. Also does not give you more space. So if you've got two hard drives in your machine in a configuration of RAID 1 and both of these hard drives are one terabyte in space, that does not mean now you have two terabytes of space. No, you still have just one terabyte of space. But the data is now replicated between the two hard drives. It is in fact mirrored is what Microsoft calls it. So RAID 1 uses a concept called striping. RAID 1 uses a concept called mirroring. In other words, it's making an exact replica, a clone. So RAID 1 does not give you performance. It does not give you speed, but it does give you fault tolerance, and it does give you redundancy. So in the event, God forbid, that you lose one of these two drives, you lose no data. You can just go and remove the failed hard drive, put a new fresh one in, and it's going to start replicating. How long that takes, I cannot tell you. It depends on the size of the hard drives. It depends on how full these hard drives is. It depends on what kind of system we're talking about. But on average, I can give you an estimation. It takes about a day and a half per terabyte. So if it's one terabyte's worth of data, it's going to take about a day and a half. If it's two terabytes, it's going to take about three days. If it's three terabytes, it's going to take four and a half. If it's four terabytes, it's going to take about six days. That's just a more or less estimation from what I've seen based on my personal experience. Obviously, it could go, could go a little bit longer. It could go a little bit less. Now, moving on to RAID 5. What is the minimum amount of hard drives required for this? No, it is not two hard drives, guys. Here, you need a minimum of three hard drives. Now, the good news is we know it gives us speed. It gives us redundancy and fault tolerance. It gives us all the goodies, quite frankly. And if you lose one of these drives, any one of the free drives, you can recover from that. The parity bit that I mentioned there, it moves around on the free hard drives. And you know, if one of your fail, if one of your free hard drives fails, using the parity bit is able to figure out what data is missing and it's able to reconstruct itself. Now, unfortunately, in the event that you lose more than one hard drive out of the free hard drives, yeah, well. You're not going to be able to recover from that, guys. So you ideally don't want to lose more than one. If you lose one, you need to try and recover that and fix it and replace it as quickly as you possibly can. You know, because if you lose the second one, yeah, it's not going to not be nice. All right, let's talk about removable storage drives. We did actually somewhat mention this to you guys earlier when we spoke about external storage. So when it comes to removable storage drives, there's a couple of pictures for you guys. You know, I think you guys can distinguish what is what there. So at the top, we've got something like an external drive. There in the middle, we've got a memory stick, thumb drive, flash drive, USB stick, whatever you want to go and call it. It's got so many names, I can't even keep track. And then also in that picture, we've got a memory card, or it could be a memory card adapter by the looks of things. And then way at the bottom, we've got some memory card slots or readers, should I say. So those are actually readers for memory cards. So when it comes to our external drives, you have what we call drive enclosures. Now, exactly which ones you use and how big they are, well, that's going to be dictated by the size of your actual hard drive. Is it the laptop hard drive we're talking about, or is it the normal old school desktop hard drive? You'll find if it's a laptop hard drive, the enclosure just needs to plug into a USB port. Sometimes they come up two USB wires, and that's it. It's got enough power that it's going to get from the USB ports to be able to power up that hard drive. But if you look at the enclosures for those desktop external hard drives, yeah, those ones normally need extra oomph. So you're going to have to plug it into an extra external power source to actually get that puppy to fire up. Flash drives, well, I think that speaks for itself. I and mean, we've been using that for the last decade or so. So everybody has a flash drive. If you haven't seen one, then I don't know where you've been. 
And then we all, of course, know what memory cards are. They come in various shapes, come in various sizes. And when I say sizes, I mean the actual form factors, and I also mean the actual size um, of data that it contains, the amount of data that it contains. All right, let's move on to optical drives. This is the last topic for the second main section. So I find it extremely unlikely that you guys are going to get any questions about this in the exam. I haven't seen any in the exam. And you're probably not going to even work of this in your real life career. Half of the machines you go and buy these days do not come out with an optical drive anymore. Desktops, laptops, you name it. If you go to a tech store, computer store, or wherever you go and buy a computer these days, you'll find half of these machines do not come out with an optical drive. They know that nobody uses any discs anymore. I mean, when last have you used a disc? Be honest. Think about it. Nobody uses it. The only thing we might, and this is a big maybe, use it for, is to install your operating system. And even then, we don't really do that. We just use a USB stick, or we're going to install it over the network. So yeah, guys, you're not really going to find these anymore. But if you do find them, you know, just for interest's sake, so these are the optical disc types we get, or should I say we used to get. You get your compact disc, in other words, CD. You know, so I can't even remember when that came out. I think that came out when I was a child, when I was just very, very young, when compact discs came out. So that's how we used to listen to music after cassettes. Then you get your DVD, you know, so that's how people pirate their movies and stuff. You're not supposed to go and do that, by the way. And then you, of course, get your Blu-ray disc. They obviously have way more space than your normal Blu-ray disc. So a standard CD would normally have approximately about 700 megabits of space. A standard DVD would somewhere be somewhere in a range of about 4.8 gigs to about 8.2 gigs, somewhere around there. But you do get, you know, some DVDs that massively exceed that. Blu-rays, they can be 20 gigs, 40 gigs, 80 gigs. Some of them are even larger than that, depending on what kind of Blu-ray we're talking about. Anywho, let's move on to the third main section in this module. That would be install and configure system memory. So for the most part, this is going to be things like your RAM, but it's not limited to your RAM. All right, so the first main topic in this section, and this is also no surprise, is got to do with, well, you've guessed it, RAM, system RAM, and virtual memory. Oh, look at that. So it's not just RAM, it's also virtual memory. Ooh. All right, so in this topic, let's list system memory. System memory, as you guys know, that is your RAM in your laptop or your desktop. That is volatile memory. If you look at something like the hard drives we spoke of earlier, that will be an example of non-volatile memory. You need you guys need to make sure you remember that because they're going to ask you questions about that in the exam. So what do they mean by volatile? Volatile means that if I were to remove power to my laptop or my desktop, in other words, I yank out the battery or the power cord, whatever is in the RAM would be lost. Your machine would forget it. Non-volatile would mean if I you were to go and remove power to the system, it's not going to forget. So if you think about it, what is in your RAM is whatever I've got open on my machine right now. So if you have a presentation open or a game open or a program open, anything you've got open on your laptop or your desktop right now, that is in your RAM. When you open files and documents and programs and games, they get loaded from the hard drive into your RAM. Your RAM is what you're working on currently. Now, if I were to yank out the battery of the laptop or yank out the power cord of your desktop PC, would you agree with me that everything you had open on your machine is now going to be closed? And when you start that machine back up again, you are going to have to go and reopen all those documents and files and games and programs. Are they lost? No, they're not lost. You just need to go and open them again. Why? Because whatever was in the RAM is now lost. It's because the RAM is volatile. Now, why is the stuff not lost? Because it was stored on the hard drive, which is in fact non-volatile. So you'll notice that whatever is stored on the hard drive is never really gone if you yank out the power. It's just you're going to have to go and reopen it and reload it into the 
gram. Now you guys know what volatile means. So if they ask you in the exam, what does volatile mean? Now you remember, it's when you remove power and whatever is in that memory gets lost. In other words, RAM. Now, what the heck is virtual memory? Now, the first thing I want to point out about virtual memory, this is also sometimes known as page file memory. That, guys, is when you use a portion of your hard drive as if it is RAM. Now, the hard drive is not nearly as fast as your RAM. The RAM is way, way faster than your hard drive, which is why anything you've got open gets loaded into the RAM, because whatever you're working on goes ziggity-zag between the CPU and the RAM as your machine works on it. If it, had to, if it had to go ziggity-zag the whole time between the CPU and the hard drive, nothing would get done because the hard drive would give the information to the CPU just too slow. Now, page file memory, or should I say, Virtual memory is if your RAM is full, the overflow would then go into your virtual memory or page file memory, which is in fact a small portion of your hard drive. It's obviously not nearly as fast as your RAM, but it's still better than nothing if you're running out of RAM. So if you for argument's sake has 16 gigs of RAM and that's completely full, completely used up, the overflow will flow into your virtual memory or page file memory. And obviously, when you know you no longer need it, it's just going to resort to using the RAM again. So it's not nearly as good as the actual RAM, like we said, but it is still better than having nothing. At least you can still get stuff done. Anyway, enough of that. Let's move on to our next topic here, multi-channel system memory. There's a bit of a picture for you guys. Now, the very first thing I want to draw your attention to is the fact that this motherboard in front of us has four RAM modules. If you guys hear noise in the background, sorry, my neighbor is busy with a chainsaw. Can you believe it? Now, the average motherboard will normally have about two RAM module slots. This one is a fancy expensive one that's got four RAM module slots. Something else that I want to draw your attention to is the fact that there's two different colors there. What the colors is doesn't matter. What is important is which ones are the same color. So starting from the left, you'll notice the first one and the third one is the same color. It looks like a dark gray kind of color. The second one and the fourth one is the same color. Why is that? Is it important? Yes, very important. That means those RAM slots are the same channel. You want to ideally try and fill up a channel first before you start on the next one. So if you find yourself in a situation where you only have one RAM chip, one RAM stick, one RAM module, whatever you want to go and call it, it's got so many names, then I would suggest you start at the slot closest to your CPU, your processor unit. Near the day, you know, it's probably going to be only one inch closer or one centimeter closer, but that is light years for a computer, guys. Light years. It's very, very far. So the closer you can get the RAM modules to the CPU, the better. So I would suggest you start off with the chip closest or the slot closest to your CPU. And if you find yourself with a second RAM module, you're not going to put it into the second slot. No. You are going to fill up that channel first so you're going to go and look for the other slot that's the same color in this case it's going to be the third one there and you'll also very often see that normally on the motherboard these channels are clearly labeled it's going to tell you channel one or channel two or channel a and channel b so the first slot and the third slot will be labeled very clearly on the motherboard as being the same channel so besides the colors just check on the motherboard guys so you're going to fill up that channel first if you happen to have a second chip. If you get yourself a third chip, you're going to start from the left again. And if you get a fourth chip, you're going to go to the right again. As simple as that, guys. So make sure you put your chips on the same channel. Now, moving on to our next topic here. It is still about memory. It's still about RAM. It says ECC RAM. What is that? So that stands for error correcting code. It's error correcting RAM. Now your normal desktop and laptop RAM guys doesn't have that, doesn't do that. Trust me, if it had that, you'd be paying an arm and a leg for it. Very, very expensive to have that benefit. So that is something you'll find in your server RAM chips. 
Now, why is that? Because it helps prevent something called BSOD, blue screen of death, also known as a memory dump, also known as a stop error. It's got many names. So what the heck is a blue screen of death? And why do we get it? And how does this actually help prevent that? So a blue screen of death can be caused by many things, but nine out of 10 times, guys, it's caused by some sort of issue in the RAM, some sort of error, some sort of corruption. And whenever that happens, your machine doesn't know what the heck is going on. So it dumps whatever is in the RAM. Hence the name, memory dump. Now, we can absolutely not afford to have a blue screen of death on a server. I mean, that is catastrophic in most cases. So what can we do about that? That, guys, is where your ECC RAM comes into play. The majority of server RAM chips has this built into them. And if and when you would have encountered the blue screen of death, guess what? You're not going to get it because the RAM chip is, in fact, going to go and correct the issue automatically by itself. How neato is that? Very, very useful, let me tell you, because now that server is not going to encounter some sort of blue screen of death, which means there's not downtime, which means it's not going to crash, and whatever service it was rendering is not unavailable. So normally when a server crashes, and if a server is unavailable, depending on what service this is, and depending on a company, this company could very well be losing millions. There has been companies that I worked with where they would sometimes lose up to a million a minute. You do not want to work with one of those companies. The amount of pressure they put on you is insane, guys. Literally every couple of seconds, the bosses and the technicians and the engineers are asking you, how far are you? How far are you? Are you back up and running yet? Are you back up and running yet? It is just mind-boggling that amount of pressure. You don't want that. Trust me. Anyway, guys, that concludes the third main section. And now we can move on to the fourth and the last main section in this module, which is install and configure CPUs. So the very first characteristic that we can talk about, you know, when it comes to features of CPUs is the clock speed. So you'll notice these CPUs, processors, whatever you want to go and call them, they come in various speeds. That is not the main deciding factor though for how fast your machine will be. It's one of the deciding factors, but one of the other things you need to go and look at is the cache inside your CPU. You will find if you go to a store, one CPU might be 2.5 gigahertz and the next one might be 3.4 gigahertz. And you would think maybe the 3.4 will be more expensive because it's faster. But very often that's not the case. You might find that the 2.5 gigahertz CPU might actually very well be more expensive. If you go look closer, you'll find that the slower clock speed CPU has a much, much bigger cache. And that cache, it's, not, it's normally made out of gold in some cases. That's basically memory, temporary memory, should I say, that it's built into the actual CPU itself. The more memory that there is actually physically inside the CPU, the less stuff there is that has to be sent out to the RAM. Remember, that is light years for your computer. So if it's got less stuff that it needs to send out to RAM, just so much better, guys. All right, and then we also have something called multi-threading. These days, you'll notice just about any CPU has something called multi-threading. What you might also hear of is people talking about single core or multi-core. I can't remember the last time I found a CPU that's got a single core. I think the last time I saw that might have been... I'm trying to thumb suck it here and think now. I think that was around 2008, maybe? Was with the old Celeron CPUs of Intel, those kinds of CPUs. That was probably around 2007, 2008. And from there, you know, we started encountering our dual cores and core to deuce and quad cores. And then we had our i3s, i5s, i7s. And all of those CPUs come out of multiple cores. Now, if you have something like an i7 that's got four cores, if you go check on the actual analytics and stuff of the machine, you might see it actually might appear to you like you've got eight CPUs, eight cores. That's not necessarily the case. So you can normally go and half that and that will actually give you the real amount that you've got. So if it says you've got eight CPUs, you in reality normally have four cores and these four cores are what we call hyper-threaded. It doesn't actually make your computer faster when you've got hyper-threading. It just wastes less time 
calculating data. So what multi-threading does is you can imagine it like using both your hands to feed your mouth. So instead of using one hand, you're using both hands. You're not making your mouth faster by using both your hands, but you are wasting less time. So the one hand can hold up a cookie and the other hand can also hold up a cookie. And then while the one hand puts the cookie into your mouth, the next hand is already ready on standby to put the next cookie into your mouth. So that's basically all that hyperthreading comes down to. It's more efficient use of your CPU where it spends less time or wastes less time just idling there. Now, when we say CPU is idling, this is probably like nanoseconds or a fraction of a second, but that's like a lifetime in a, in a sense of a CPU chip. So we're just wasting less of the CPU's time using it more optimally. And let's also talk about virtualization support. So once again, around 2008, 2009, the majority of CPUs did not support virtualization. So if you wanted to create something like a virtual machine or do something like some sort of virtualization, you needed to make sure you've got yourself a 64-bit CPU. You needed to make sure you've got a 64-bit operating system installed on your machine. You needed to make sure you've got a lot of RAM and besides all that nonsense, you had to go into your BIOS back then. Nowadays, we use what we call a UFI. But back then, you had to go into your BIOS, and you normally had to make sure you've turned on virtualization because it was normally disabled by default. It's literally just a switch that says disabled. You go and say enabled. It's called virtualization, and that was it. Then that machine would support virtualization. Nowadays, you're not going to find a CPU in a motherboard that does not by default support 64-bit, that does not by default support virtualization, and even if it does support all of that stuff, you're going to notice this is also normally turned on by default. That is where we are at this point in time. Pretty interesting, right? Anywho, moving slowly but surely to some of our last topics in this module, let's talk about CPU socket types. So the very first thing we want to talk about in this section is the subtopic called zero insertion force. Now, what the heck does that mean? I think to help with this, you know, to help it make a little bit more sense, here's a picture for you guys of a chap that is putting in a CPU. Now, when normally when you go put in a CPU, you know what you're going to do. You're going to go and hover your CPU over the CPU slot. You're going to turn it clockwise or anti-clockwise until you see it aligns, you know, all the little ridges and stuff aligned. Very gently, you're going to put it into its place, and that is it. That's called zero insertion force. The fact that you do not need to press down on it, you just put it into its place, into its slot, very gently, just so that you don't bend any pins. You close the little latch. So if you look at that guy's hand, there's a little latch that's currently open. You close the latch. And it's normally like a little lever, which I do not seem to see in this picture. And you just press that lever down and click into place. That automatically clicks the CPU chip into place. That whole concept, guys, is called zero insertion force. You don't have to put down any force on the CPU. You just put it down. You close the latch. That's it. Done. End of story. Next subtopic I want to mention to you guys is something called LAN grid array, more commonly known as LGA. So for the most part, you'll find LGA CPUs are all over the place. These are predominantly Intel socket form factors. So almost all Intel CPUs, at least all the new ones we get these days, they are what we call LGA. Now, what does that mean? We know it's LAN grid array, but what does it actually mean? LAN grid array is when the pins are on the motherboard and not the CPU. So when it comes to Intel, many, many moons ago, the pins used to actually be on the CPU chip side of things. I myself am not a fan of that because if you were to go and compare the price of the average CPU and the average motherboard, you would find that the CPU is normally up to sometimes up to six times more expensive than your motherboard. So if you had to accidentally break one of these two, which one would you prefer to break? If it was me, I would prefer to break the one that's cheaper, whichever one that might be. Now, usually, in most cases, I'm not saying this is always the case, the motherboard is usually the cheaper one out of the two. So what Intel came up with, they said, okay, boys, this is very expensive. It's costing people an arm and a leg. Let's move the pins to the motherboard. 
It's not the only reason they did that, but it is one of the reasons. So now, if you bend a pin or you break a pin, it's on the motherboard side. And the motherboard is the cheaper one out of the two. Your CPU will be perfectly fine. So in essence, in conclusion, what can we say about LGA? LGA stands for Land Grid Array, and that means the pins are on the motherboard side. Here's a bit of a picture for you guys. So in that picture, I know it's not very clear. I tried to make it as large as possible for you guys. That is a motherboard where the pins are on the motherboard. You can see all of those are pins. So if you were to go and zoom in very closely, you would find that that's actually the pins on the motherboard. Now, the next subtopic here is pin grid array. PGA for short. You can kind of guess what that means. I mean, I just explained to you guys what LGA is. So can you guess what PGA is? It's the opposite, guys. PGA is when the pins are on the CPU and not the motherboard. So PGA, you know, if we talk about Intel, that used to be the old Intel motherboards. Now, PGA is still very widely used, guys. That is predominantly used by AMD socket form factors. So when it, if you go look at Intel, the pins are on the motherboard side. If you go look at something like AMD, the pins are on the CPU side of things. I'm not a fan of that, but you know, that's AMD for you. So I'm not saying it's a bad CPU. Absolutely not. Some of them are amazing. I just really don't like the fact that the pins are on the CPU. Bad idea in my opinion. So in conclusion, the pins are on the CPU chip when we talk about PGA. Well, folks, can you believe it? That brings us to the end of this section, to the end of this module. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I hope you guys have learned something. If you have, do your homie a favor and give the video a like. That gives me an indication that you actually learned something from this module. And, you know, there's obviously the added benefit, the fact that it's going to promote the video a little bit so that YouTube pushes it out to more people. The more people that see it, the better. The more people we get to help. Now, before you guys disappear on me, just a special thank you to the Patreon sponsors, the PayPal sponsors, those folks that buy me coffees and milkshakes, and those of you that click on the thanks button below the video. Thank you very much, guys. I really, very, very much appreciate that. So here's a screen of the, some of the Patreon sponsors' names, the PayPal sponsors' names. And um, if you would like to sponsor the channel yourself, you can find all of that information in the video description down below. The Patreon, the PayPal, if you want to go buy me a coffee or a milkshake, that's down there. Or you can just go click on a thanks button below the video. Alright guys, I will see you in module 3 of the CompTIA A-plus course.